And we are back with Investigate Joe Rogan. This is the podcast where I fact check and investigate things that have been said on the Joe Rogan experience. Today I'll be looking into episode 1710 with Colin Hoback. This is the guy who made the Into the Storm documentary about QAnon. The first thing I want to talk about, though, is Bill Maher. While they're talking about HBO, who were the ones who picked up Into the Storm, Rogan brings up the fact that they were also the ones who picked up Bill Maher's show, Politically Incorrect, after it got canceled. This is true, but Rogan leaves out why it got canceled, and I want to explain this, mostly because it's sort of funny. So after 9-11, if you can think back to those days, George Bush called the hijackers cowards. Now, they were already dead by this point, so they didn't hear him. But it was more about the general statement of criticizing terrorist actions, of course. On 9-17, Bill had special guest Dinesh D'Souza on his show, believe it or not. And they both disagreed with this. Dinesh D'Souza said that the hijackers were not cowards and that they were really warriors. Bill went even further and said, quote, We have been the cowards, lobbing cruise missiles from 2,000 miles away. That's cowardly. Staying in the airplane when it hits the building? Say what you want about it. It's not cowardly. First of all, I object to the usage of the word we here. I was alive at the time, and I never lobbed cruise missiles at anyone, so I don't want to be included in that. But basically what Bill is saying here is that killing people with missiles is cowardly, but killing civilians with airplanes is very brave and badass. I will say that I respect the extreme level of edge it must have taken to say this six days after 9-11, even if I don't agree with what he's actually saying. However, Bill took it all back and apologized afterwards. After it became clear that his show was probably going to get canceled, he said, In no way was I intending to say, nor have I ever thought, that the men and women who defend our nation in uniform are anything but courageous and valiant. And I offer my apologies to anyone who took it wrong. My criticism was meant for politicians who, fearing public reaction, have not allowed our military to do the job they are obviously ready, willing, and able to do, and who now will, I'm certain, as they always have, get it done. So not only did he apologize, but he went on to basically say that the real problem is that politicians are holding soldiers back. If only soldiers could be free to just indiscriminately do whatever they wanted, surely we would have solved all the Middle East's problems by now. This apology and endorsement of the military-industrial complex didn't even work, and his show got canceled anyway. In my opinion, this is not exactly some big moment for free speech like Rogan makes it out to be. I think this is very cringe, in fact, and that's a big criticism coming from me. That's, I don't throw that word around. One of the few things that Colin Hoback said that I think is wrong is that the government can access Signal the encrypted messenger app. You have probably heard of Signal because that weird guy you know uh, recommended it to you. There was a big WikiLeaks release that made people think that the government could access Signal, and WikiLeaks themselves even said this, but it isn't really true. What the CIA documents were actually talking about is that if they can get into your phone or computer, whatever device you're using Signal on, then they can access Signal. At that point, Signal's encryption doesn't matter. But there's nothing in there that says they have actually broken Signal's encryption itself. Could they have broken Signal's encryption itself and just nobody knows about it? Yeah. I mean, who knows what they could have secretly. But there's no real reason to think that they can get in. On Twitter, Open Whisper Systems, who started the development of Signal, said, quote, The CIA slash WikiLeaks story today is about getting malware onto phones. None of the exploits are in Signal or Break Signal protocol encryption. The story isn't about Signal or WhatsApp. But to the extent that it is, we see it as a confirmation that what we're doing is working. Now, full disclosure, as people have pointed out in the YouTube comments of my videos, I certainly seem like I work for the CIA. So maybe I just want you to think Signal is safe. You will have to keep that in mind. 
I also think that Hoback is wrong about one other thing, and that's the idea that Ron Watkins actually served as an advisor to Trump in some capacity. I couldn't find any evidence that Ron Watkins really advised Trump per se. The most direct contact they are confirmed to have had was Trump retweeting Ron. But if you think back to the days of Trump not being banned from Twitter, he actually retweeted all sorts of stuff. So him retweeting Ron Watkins doesn't necessarily mean that they were in contact beyond that. Maybe they secretly were, but personally I doubt it. Hoback also briefly mentions the idea that Ron Watkins could somehow be held legally accountable for all this QAnon stuff. He doesn't make a definitive statement either way, but I thought I would look into it more. First of all, despite how convincing the documentary is, there's no proof that Ron Watkins is Q. But if there was proof that it was him, did he actually break any laws by doing all this stuff? Could he go to jail or something? If definitive proof ever came out. If you've seen the documentary, then you know that Fred has said that Ron should go to jail for impersonating a federal agent. And this is really something that's illegal. Title 18 USCA 912 says, quote, whoever falsely assumes or pretends to be an officer or employee acting under the authority of the United States or any department, agency, or office thereof, and acts as such, or in such pretended character, demands or obtains any money, paper, document, or thing of value, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than three years or both. So did Ron Watkins pretend to be a federal government employee? As far as I know, Q never directly said that he was working for the federal government, or just the government at all. However, he did of course claim to have Q-level security clearance which would basically be impossible if he wasn't. So essentially, yes, he did claim to be an officer under the authority of the United States. The really tricky part, though, is where the law says, and acts as such. It's not enough to just pretend. That's not illegal. You also have to act as such. Was Ron Watkins acting as such? Was he acting as a federal officer? Well, not really. All he did was post on 8chan. That's all he actually did. He didn't actually try to do anything that a federal agent would do. I mean, the actual point of this law is to prevent things like fake arrests and scams. However, the law may not actually be that strict. Someone was once arrested under this law for asking for someone's address while pretending to be an IRS agent. He didn't tell the person that they had to give up the address because he worked for the IRS. He just said that he worked for the IRS, sort of trying to lead them on into thinking that they would have to tell him. There's another interesting case that's maybe more relevant in a weird way. A guy was renting a room in a house, and he would just casually keep a holstered gun on him for some reason. He told the landlady that he worked for the FBI, when she found out that he didn't actually work for the FBI and he was just some weirdo, she took him to court. She said that she wouldn't have let this guy walk around with a gun in her house if he hadn't said he was in the FBI. And the court sided with her and she won the case. So he wasn't breaking the law just by wearing the gun. And he wasn't breaking the law just by casually lying and saying he was in the FBI. But together, this was enough to constitute impersonation and acting as such, which is illegal. On a side note, I wish more info about this case was available because it sounds pretty funny. Why did this guy need to do any of this? Why did he need to carry this gun around inside the house where he lived? Was he, was he just really paranoid or something? Anyway, could it be argued that Ron Watkins' actions as Q, while he was pretending to be Q, are similar to wearing the gun just like the lady wouldn't have let him do it if she knew the truth, Q's followers would have acted differently if they knew the truth. Honestly, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. But my theory is that if proof that Ron Watkins was Q ever came out, someone would at least try to bring this to court, probably Fred, and it wouldn't get immediately dismissed. There does seem to be something here. The real question is, could this be used to arrest Eric Andre, for those episodes of his show where he pretends to be a cop. Someone needs to investigate that 
I think. That's the real case here. They do talk about things other than QAnon in this episode. They talk a lot about big tech, and Rogan says that you, the user, are Google's product, which is not really true. Ad space is Google's product. Basically, all of their profits come from ads. They're basically just a big digital billboard company. It's possible that Google secretly sells user data to other companies, but even if they do, they would have to be charging truly massive amounts of money for it to be anywhere near the amount they make with ads, and they would have to have huge hidden profits. When I was reading about this, I couldn't help but think that it's pretty weird that one of the biggest companies in the world wouldn't exist if everyone just used Adblock. YouTube is basically unusable without Adblock now, in my opinion. I like to think that Google lives in perpetual fear of the day when boomers realize that Adblock exists. Overall, I think that this Hoback guy has a pretty good understanding of this whole thing. I definitely recommend the documentary. I found it to be very interesting and a pretty reasonable look at the whole thing. If I have one bone to pick with this guy, though, I think it's that in this episode, he is sort of too easy on Ron Watkins. He and Rogan don't seem to take the whole thing very seriously. Now, I'm not saying that QAnon isn't funny. Don't get me wrong. There is definitely something very funny about a weeaboo who lives in Japan convincing a bunch of boomers that they're taking part in this epic cyber mystery to save America and that they are basically in a Metal Gear game or something. There is no denying the humor in this situation. However, you can read tons of stories online about people cutting off friends and family over QAnon and never speaking again. People got divorced over this. And it might be even worse than that. There is a subreddit called QAnon Casualties that's supposed to be sort of a forum for people with family or friends who are really into QAnon. And there are multiple threads on there where the poster is talking about how their family member committed suicide because of QAnon. When they realized it wasn't real and Trump had really lost, they just couldn't hack it anymore. I couldn't verify any of these suicides with other news sources, but it seems plausible to me. And I haven't even mentioned the sort of ideological damage of QAnon, or the cultural damage, or whatever you want to call it. Basically, I think it would have been good to address the damage this stuff caused. That being said, I do still think he was the best guest in a while. And the documentary is very good. Thanks for listening. If you weren't listening, I'd just be talking to myself, like usual. You can email me or message me on Twitter if you want. And I will see you next episode.